right. Okay, I do We're believe live. we are live. Greetings to those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live. This is the final week of our Advent study at Memorial. We've been working through Light of the World um, by Amy Jill Levine, and, uh, and she is actually with us today and has invited us to call her AJ, um, and we are very happy to do that. Um, of course. And so we are going to move through our what has become our normal format over the last number of weeks. We're going to open just now with a word of prayer, and then we're going to read the scripture together. Um, and then I will lead us through our conversation today. So why don't you join me as we pray together? And gracious God, we do give thanks um, that we can gather together through this season and consider stories and events that are thousands of years old. Um, that are rooted in a history um, even older than that. And we give thanks for the things that we've been learning, the things that we have been understanding as we've moved through this book. And we give thanks for AJ uh, that she has joined us here today um, and will be part of this final conversation in this study. And would you grant us your grace in our conversation, your wisdom, your energy, um, and, uh, and just some good times together as we open up our hearts and our minds to your very presence among us. We ask it in and through the name of Christ. Amen. 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 Okay, so why don't we uh, read through the scripture together? And, uh, and Drew, you're going to kick us off with that. Drew. I'm, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> this is how the birth of Christ took place. When Mary, his mother, was engaged to Joseph, before they were married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man because he didn't want to humiliate her, he decided to call off their engagement quietly. As he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place so that what was the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did just as an angel from God commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he didn't have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son. Joseph called him Jesus. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem him in the territory of Judea, during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and we've come to honor him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. He gathered all the chief priests and the legal experts and asked them where the Christ was to be born. They said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote, you Bethlehem of Judah, land of Judah, by no means are you the least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out from the time when the star had just appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search carefully for the child. When you found him, report to me so that I too may go and honor him. When they had heard the king, they went and looked and look, the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother. Falling to their knees, they honored him. They opened their treasure chests and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. They went back to their own country by another route. When the Magi had departed, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod will soon search for the child in order to kill him. Joseph got up and during the night took the child and his mother to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod died. And this fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I have called my son out of Egypt. We thank God for his word. 
So um, here we are uh, with a special guest in our conversation today. And AJ, before we get going, I, I wonder, would you just sort of give us a couple of minutes of an introduction to yourself? And um, and I think that would just, just be good for people to hear before we get going. Well, um, what to say? Um, I, I teach New Testament and Jewish studies at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, which is like COVID central right now. So I have good thoughts for the state of Tennessee. Um, I'm from Massachusetts, so I'm, I'm misplaced in the South. Um, uh, what else? I'm Jewish. I go to an Orthodox synagogue, but I'm not Orthodox in practice, but I just happen to love the congregation and the worship and uh, it, it works for me. So I, I am a Jew who goes to an Orthodox synagogue and teaches at Vanderbilt Divinity School where I train people who want to be Christian ministers how to read the New Testament. That, that sort yeah, of does hey, it. That, that, is, that is perfect. And um, listen, we are going to just sort of take some time to go through this fourth chapter that, that we've been reading this past week. Um, and our habit has been simply to ask around the screen, what, what are the things that have stood out for us? What are the things that we have underlined or made a note at on the way through? Um, and I, I would actually like to, to open us just with, um, with one which really attaches itself to what you just finished up saying there, because you teach um, students who are going on to become clergy potentially um, how to read the Bible. And I think that one of the things that we notice in your book here has been how you highlight the differences between Matthew and between Luke and how they're both telling a story with the same characters, but similar aspects to the story. And, um, and just how you, you point out the differences that are in there. But I, I think also, and I'd love to hear you talk about this, why is it so important as students of the Bible or as um, as those who, who seek to study um, the scriptures, why is it important that we notice those things and reflect on them? And how can that help us in our, in our dealings with scripture throughout? What a great question. Thank you. Um, why is it important? It's important because the church in its wisdom gave us four gospels. And why would we want to mush them together? So at the very least, it honors what the people who put the canon together did. Um, second, because in the same way, if, and I'm going to use Christian terminology here. So if you look at the Old Testament, so the Christian Bible part one, um, the story of creation is simply too grand to be told only in one way. So you have one version in Genesis chapter one, and you have a different version in Genesis chapter two, four B and following, right? um, cause it's just too big a story. Well, the incarnation is even an even bigger story from the Christian perspective. So you're going to get it in a variety of different ways. You're going to get the Christmas stories in Matthew and Luke. You're going to get the in the beginning was the word and that magnificent prologue to the Gospel of John. And Mark goes, eh, fair. we don't need that. Let's just start with John the Baptist and get the story going. Um, why look at Jesus only in one way? Um, and even if you just take the fully human Jesus, why look at him in only one way? So if you, if you want to understand somebody, uh, even somebody today, how you understand individuals will depend upon the person you ask. So my children have a different relationship with me uh, and different memories of me, and both kids would have different memories, than say my husband or my in-laws uh, or my best friend or the, the women I hang out with in our women's group, right? Um, so if you want to know who I am, if you ask these different people, you will get different responses. And that's part of what the Gospels are doing, is they're giving us four different insights into the memory of Jesus. And it's memories um, perhaps based originally on some eyewitness testimony, and then stories gave rise to other stories, gave rise to other stories. As you can even see in the Gospel of Matthew, people would have experienced Jesus in dreams in the same way that Joseph is having dreams. Mrs. Pilate later on in, in I don't have her name for her, so Mrs. Pilate um, has, has a dream about Jesus. Um, and that becomes part of that repository of stories. So read them independently because they're really, really good stories. And then if you want to do a Christmas scene where you got the Magi over here and the shepherds from Luke over here and the little drummer boy and whoever, you know, the littlest angel and the Grinch and whoever else kind of populates the crash, that's fine too. But it's better to read the stories individually because they're telling, they're giving different messages in different ways and all of those messages are important. 
Excellent. Guys, what else did you notice as you read through the chapter? What would you like to talk about? Well, I'd like to talk about the women in the genealogy. Bruh! Yes. yes. Yeah. I, I, I've written a study about 12 women from the Bible, so I'm particularly interested in the women's experiences and what they have to, to teach us. Um, uh, I was curious about why you think that the author of Matthew chose Tamar but excluded Leah from yeah. the genealogy because I find Leah a very fascinating character and uh, often overlooked um, in the, when we study uh, the Old Testament. And uh, secondly, um, I'm curious about uh, your referencing the four women uh, whose who have unusual sexual relationships with, yes. you know. We could call them obstetrical irregularities. <laughs> oh, I love that term. That, that's great. I really like that. But in particular, um, Bathsheba. Now, so, some people might be squirming when I ask this question, but, you know, our congregation is pretty open-minded, so I'm confident that they're not going to squirm too long. I have always wondered about Bathsheba's relationship with David and whether that relationship was really started with a rape because yeah. did Bathsheba really have a choice? She was summoned by the king, no less. So if you can touch on those two questions for me, that would be great. That's a great question. I like working with you all. Um, <laughs> so a lot of people got left out. I mean, Sarah got left out, uh, Rebecca got left out. Uh, Leah got left out, so, and, and Rachel gets, gets a nod in chapter two of, of Matthew, the Rachel weeping for her children. Um, and whenever I hear Rachel, I always put in Leah. It's like, you can't do one without the other. In the same way, when I hear Sarah, I put in Hagar, because I don't think you can do one without the other. They necessarily remind you. Um, I, I think Tamar is there in part because Tamar signals, uh, as does Abraham himself, the Gentile mission. So the, the Gentile mission permeates the entire gospel of Matthew. So you have some Gentile women in the genealogies. Tamar, her reception history, we're not sure where she's from, but she looks like a Gentile. Rahab, definitely a Gentile. She's the prostitute from Jericho. Uh, Bathsheba, we're not exactly sure, but she's married to a Gentile, and he's the one who's actually named because the genealogy does not say Bathsheba. It says in Greek, actually, uh, to Ecurio, uh, she of Uriah, and Uriah is definitely a Hittite, and Ruth is clearly a Moabite. So there's part of that Gentile mission there, but, but there's something else going on there, I think. And this is so cool about all of these women. Um, and if you wanna drop in uh, Uriah rather than Bathsheba, so we're gonna put her to the side for a moment. Um, they all act righteously when the men with whom they are paired are less so. So when I get to Matthew chapter 15, where I have whom Matthew identifies as a Canaanite woman, and she's the one who has the demon possessed daughter and she asked Jesus to do an exorcism. And he basically says to her, lady, you're not at my table, right? I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. It's very harsh statements. You know, she's gonna prevail because you know all these women prevailed. Even when people like um, uh, the spies who come into Jericho uh, and the first thing they do is go into a brothel and I don't think after 40 years in the wilderness, uh, when you finally get to where you need to go, the first place you go is to a brothel, you're not going to check on the munitions, right? So, um, and I'm trusting your congregation got that. Um, so, so the women are the faithful ones, the men, the men less so. And that brings us to the question of David and Bathsheba. We don't know. So on the one hand, it could be Bathsheba hashtag me too. Uh, Bathsheba could be, could be a victim of rape, and then she becomes a survivor, right? She gets to be queen mother, and she, she helps engineer getting Solomon on the throne. On the other hand, and here's the genius of the author of 2 Samuel, and we're in 2 Samuel 11 here. Um, he tells us right at the beginning of this chapter that in the spring of the year, I'm trying to remember this, and I, I might get some of the words, but in the spring of the year, when kings go off to battle, um, and the ark and the army are out, David is in Jerusalem, so he's not doing what kings do, um, and, you know, in the, in the late afternoon, he takes a walk on his, his palace wall, and he sees Bathsheba, and the question is, when he sees her, does she see him, because she knows he's in town, 
So the, it could be a it could be a rape. On the other hand, she could have set him up. If you have, if you if you look at the 1950s movie David and Bathsheba, I mean, which is Gregory Peck in a skirt, which is to die for in any case. Um, <laughs> I have to tell my students because they don't know who Gregory Peck is, so I have to say he's the guy who was in To Kill a Mockingbird. He's Atticus Finch. Anyway, um, in the 50s movie, she set him up. Mm. So um, do we want to turn, do we want to read her as a victim who survives? Do we want to read her as a conniving women, woman who understands how the army works? Because she's also the daughter of an army officer and she's married to an army officer. And she knows that her husband, who's a Gentile, a Hittite, is never going to advance to the chief of the army because he's a foreign national. Do we give her agency? Do we give her agency as a victim or do we give her agency as somebody who's gonna work the system? It depends upon how you want to read her. Mm -hmm. And that's the genius of the text is you don't know. So our imaginations can just go wild. Absolutely. Um, and it also, because I really like these women um, and I'm interested in how people make judgments. So uh, although I'm not Christian, I, I find Jesus makes very wise comments very frequently. Um, one of which is don't judge. And if you do judge, you're going to be judged by the measure that you judge others by. And then you come to somebody like Bathsheba or David, and you don't have all the information. So uh, when I think about other people, like about whom I might read in the newspaper, I just have that don't judge because you don't have all the information and you don't know. So be very, very careful before you condemn somebody. That's right. Um, thank you, Alice. Great question. Um, uh, Drew, Carrie? Yeah, I actually have a question um, on, that I've had, but one of our one of our commenters on the Facebook feed has. Um, our friend Sarah says, I always find it a kind of interesting that the genealogy comes through Joseph's, Joseph's line. But if we believe in the conception by the Holy Spirit, Joseph is not Jesus's biological father. I think that the concept of this genealogy is interesting and something I was when I was reading your book and you were talking about how people who read Matthew skip over all the genealogy and get right to the story and I will confess that I have one of those people but I often am teaching it to young people who just go like this if you're doing genealogy and so um, I but I want to talk about the genealogy for just a second and I want to hear your thoughts on like um, I've read them in the text but I want to hear you talk about the genealogy and why how do we understand that in light of the story with Joseph and Mary and all of that. Right. Um, and I get the idea of skipping over because genealogies are, are comparable to looking at somebody else's pictures of their summer vacation. Like you don't really care. I mean, you're polite and you, you know, you might have a canopy or something. So oh, what a pretty sunset. You don't care. Um, I, the genealogies meant something to people in antiquity. Um, in the same way, in some small towns they do today, and I found that particularly in the South, like people will say, who are your people? Mm -hmm. Who is your granddaddy? And that makes a huge amount of difference. Or where did you come from? Where did your folks come from? And that makes a difference too. And this community is one that is absolutely like that. Absolutely. Um, and and it, there, there's, a to me, such a, a staggering sense of, of peoplehood here. I mean, this is a nation, he's talking about the Israelite nation that had been conquered by heaven knows how many people. And the idea is we're going to hang on to who we were from antiquity on. Um, the, there's also a genealogy in the Gospel of Luke, um, and it, it's completely different from David all the way down to Joseph. Uh, and consequently, there were some scribes who got a hold of copies of Luke and they kind of nudged the, the, the literature a little bit and they made the Luke genealogy Mary's genealogy. It's not, it's a scribal correction just to get around that. Wait a minute, he's not David's actual biological son. Um, did it bother people back then? No, not much, um, which is why they wrote it in the text. If you're gonna put it in there, you gotta figure it's not gonna be that bothersome. So it's an idea of double paternity. Um, they, it, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, Nathan the prophet speaking on behalf of God says to David, um, you are my son today I have you know, begotten you to use the King James language. Um, but I mean, David's mom is still David's mom. David's dad is still Jesse. But David becomes in effect the child of God. So you can use this language without anybody going, you know, it's not biologically correct. And then you have a sense of double paternity. 
And double paternity was also known on, on the pagan side as well, where everybody knew who the dad was, but the word was, oh, he's really a child of, you know, the god Zeus or uh, really a child of, of the god Apollo. Okay, fine. They knew double paternity. Didn't bother them. Um, oh. did, did the differences bother them? Yeah, not, not so much. Um, is, is either genealogy correct? We actually don't have any other record of Davidic genealogies from immediately past the Babylonian exile at the end of the fifth century, sixth century BCE, like the 530s, 520s, the Davidic household simply disappears. We don't have it. So Matthew could be right. Mark could be right. They could both have invented, but it's a sense of trying to hold on to that antiquity and saying how it's important. Um, we do have, to, to a better extent, actually, the genealogies of the priesthood, such that to this very day, Jews know who is in the priestly line and who is in the Levitical line. Hmm. 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 Interesting. Well, that's interesting. It so it sounds to me like um, it's another case of when we try really hard to make the text um, have a, I, I don't know how to say this without it being the wrong thing to say, but like, we try to make the text and we try to get everything to line up exactly right. It doesn't read black and right. We can't, we as Christians in this century can't possibly fully understand what it was like for the Jewish readers at the time. And so we get all our, our you know, mind all twisted around wrong when we're trying to put meaning into something that had a different meaning at the time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What That's you just said at the end was very, very well phrased. So we're trying okay. to give it meaning that it might not have had. Um, part of it's a confusion of genre, right? Um, there's a difference between a history book and an historical novel, right? Um, there's a difference between a fairy tale uh, and uh, a, a, a book written for children about a real person. Um, genealogies are not there simply to record names. Genealogies are doing something. Um, and we can see Matthew. Matthew's better at this than Luke. Luke's got a longer genealogy because Luke's got to backtrack everybody back to Adam. So that's, that's a long genealogy. That one's easier to skip over. And it has no women in it other than, you know, other than the husband of Mary, right? Work your way up. Uh, Matthew's clearly fudged. So Matthew, in the same way Matthew doesn't have Leah, Matthew drops out a couple of names in order to get the sequence of the 14 generations from Abraham to David and David to the Babylonian exile, and then another 14 generations from the Babylonian exile to Jesus, except if you count them up, there are only 13 names in that last group. <laughs> so you go, aha, that must be the age of the church. That's the 14th generation, right? So Matthew's playing with this. Um, and Matthew goes out of his way to say 14, 14, 14. Why? Um, because the number 14 in Hebrew letters spells out David, DVD, because D is four and V is six and D is four. So you get 14 because all Hebrew letters have numerical equivalents. So Matthew's going, David, David, David. You drop out a couple of names to do the math. Yeah. Uh, so it's doing uh, something other than just recording names. Yeah. AJ, you, you bring up an important point, and that is the the tendency in our modern minds to want to take things very literally uh, as opposed to shades of nuance and mean deeper meaning than the literal words that are being said. Um, or combine them. Because I have a number of students who are really quite on the fundamentalist side of things um, who, want, who, who do argue that every, everything that the New Testament records happened the way that it recorded it. Um, and they do have to go through certain mental gymnastics, say, in order to get the genealogies to match up. Oh, look at all the nicknames that got used. I mean, that's, that's, that, that doesn't work for me. So what I tell them is, if you want to hang on to literalism, that's fine. But the text is still a work of art. So even if you're recounting what happened, you have to choose what words to use in order to recount what happened. So why this word rather than that word? And if Matthew's, if Matthew's receiving some sort of divine dictation, why repeat this term here and use it again? So that in your own reading, Joseph being a righteous man. Well, Matthew loves the word righteous, stikaios in Greek. So what, when that word keeps showing up, what's that repetition doing to me? So even a literalist a liter, reader reading literally should be able to pick up more than just fact, fact, fact. There's an art here. 
and the text is doing something, and let's try to pay attention to what it's doing. Not dissimilar to, I, I, I like music. So if you hear, if you're listening to a symphony and you hear a theme established, and then you hear it again, but played in a minor key in the second movement, and then the timpani comes in in the third movement, you're hearing the same notes, but you're hearing it in different ways because of different instruments and different timings and different contexts. So you have a word here, and then you have it here, and then you have it here. And it's all variations on the theme, and you pay attention to all of it because each informs the other. Reading Matthew is like, like listening to a symphony. Thank you. That was rich. That's hey, beautiful. Drew, Drew, what do you have? Yeah, so in a similar performative vein, I really appreciated throughout your book the ways in which you describe the Gospels as sort of a performance art and describe like the person reading like the wise men stretching or like the humor of Zechariah like coming in blindness. I was just wondering how did you arrive at that reading of scripture? Is there like evidence that suggests like people performing uh, the gospels in that way? Or is that just sort of like an imaginative reading? Yeah, I mean, and, and those are actually two different questions. One is what's the performance? And second is how come it's funny? Because uh, you can perform something and, and it, you know, you can do a comedy routine and, and do it flat out serious and nobody might laugh. Um, yeah, most, yeah. People in, right, most people in antiquity are illiterate. So literacy is a skill. Um, and you can actually watch that increasing with the Jesus tradition. So that um, Matthew and Mark don't suggest that we don't see him reading. In the Gospel of Luke, we see him reading. That's the Luke 4, the synagogue scene where he finds the place in Isaiah where it was written. And then he mushes together a couple of quotes from Isaiah. In John, he can also write because writing is harder than reading. So it may be that the Gospels are actually giving him a bit of an upgrade. And if you get to later history, I just read this brilliant book on this. Um, the Annunciation scene, right, where Gabriel says to Mary, Hail Mary. Um, in medieval art, she's always reading a book. And sometimes she's reading Isaiah's prophecy about a, in the Greek about a virgin who will conceive. And sometimes she's reading the Psalms. So what the tradition does is it makes all these folks literate. They probably weren't. They didn't have to be. It's not like there's a lending library in Nazareth. Most, most scrolls are expensive, right? Um, so it's an oral culture, and it's an oral culture that is invested in storytelling. Um, the Old Testament, again, using the Christian term, some of that stuff's just laugh aloud funny, um, and people knew that you could capture folks' attention by being amusing. So um, for those of you who preach, which is all of you at some point, you probably took a course in preaching, where the idea is you need to get the congregation kind of hanging in with you. So you start out with a kind of happy notice or a little bit of a funny story, a little bit of self-deprecation. You know, a funny thing happened to me on the way to church today. So the congregation starts laughing and then boom, you go. Um, Roman rhetoric knew the same thing. So there's a Roman order named Horace, like Horace man, Horace. Um, and Horace talked about writing with profit with delight. If you can get people laughing along with you, you're more likely to capture their attention. They're more likely to like you, and then they're going to pay more attention to you. So the evangelists knew that. So you start out with wonderful stories and happy stories, and you get people laughing because the whole thing's supposed to be joyful. Um, I, think I think Jesus had a great sense of humor. I know the Gospel of John says Jesus wept. I think he laughed a lot. Um, I think the parables, most of them are just really quite funny in a bizarre way. Um, uh, mustard seeds do not grow into giant trees where the birds of heaven nest in their branches. That's just bizarre. Um, so find the humor. And then if you actually read this stuff out loud, so I was listening to you reading, Matthew, when, when the, the, the wise guys aren't, they're not wise men, they're, they're just <laughs> inept, you know, because you don't want to say something insulting. This, you know. But they're, they're not the sharpest knives in the drawer. Um, so when Matthew keeps talking about King Herod, King Herod, King Herod, and then the, the Magi go to King Herod, and they say, where is the one who's been born King of the Jews? That's not a really politic question. No, it's not. <laughs> so it's funny. And then Herod says, you know, go find the baby and, you know, come back and let me know. And then I'll go to, if you think the Messiah has been born, you get off your throne and you go. 
And anybody who knew about Herod, who was a paranoid megalomaniac, you know, the wise, the wise men, wise men, yeah, sure. It, had they not been warned in a dream, they'd have gone back to Herod. I think they wandered out of the text and they're still wandering. They're out there on the road. God, they're funny. They're really I love you funny. comparing them to Mo, Larry, and Curly. <laughs> I, I did think about them. However, um, uh, after I first wrote about them, I was contacted by a Zoroastrian priest who reminded me um, that priests in the Zoroastrian tradition, singular is Magus, the priests are still called Magi, and please don't make fun of the Magi. I said, yeah, fair point. See, so I, like, me, you're funny. I liked what you're saying about like how people sometimes hear humor and they think you're being insensitive or rude, like you were talking about the, the Magi, but I don't see it that way. And I think that sometimes people go through life with a little bit too much seriousness about themselves. Oh, and I there's, think so. nothing, there's nothing wrong with seeing the humor because I think you're right. I've, I remember the first time I giggled out loud at one of the parables. It was the one with the remove the log out of your own eye before you, um, yeah. I'm going to get it all wrong right now. But like, I remember- Take the log out of your eye before you take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Thank you. And I just remember laughing out loud because I thought, oh my gosh, that is hilarious to me. And somebody was like, you can't be, it's not funny. It's the gospels. And I was like, oh no, it's funny, but it's not, I'm not rude. I'm not laughing at it. I'm letting the humor help me see the story in a new way. And I just, Absolutely. I really appreciated that. Absolutely. Think about this. If you, and Jesus keeps referring to himself and other people refer to him as a bridegroom that runs through the entire biblical tradition, you know, from Matthew up to revelation. Um, which means if you're in the presence of Jesus, you should be at a wedding. That's, that's why he's eating all the time. As, I, as I've said before, I think he was on the chubby side. My <laughs> friends say he walked a lot, you know, but he took the donkey into Jerusalem. Um, so I think he's chubby. Um, I, and, and it could be around him is with, all these, with all this food, right? And all this wine, that's a celebration. And if you go to a wedding and everybody looks really sad and somber, that's not gonna be a happy marriage. <laughs> so I think I think he's bringing to use gospel language not only grace and not only forgiveness I think he's bringing joy mm -hmm. and with joy comes laughter why not yeah hey AJ I would like to ask you about something because a thread all the way through um your book is the the link with the old stories like uh, we 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 are seeing um, seeing links back into the Old Testament. I've been teaching a, a study on Revelation for the last few months. And again, seeing in the Revelation, all of these links to, to the ancient, to the Hebrew Bible, to, to these, these texts of, of old. And, and it's just been a theme again and again for these last number of months of how, um, of how the canon of scripture tells, tells one story of God's activity um, all the way through this history. And I think one of the one of the best gifts in your Advent study has been um, helping us look and stretch back into um, to older stories and um, to link Matthew to them and to link um, these these stories that we're reading. And we sometimes let stand alone as nativity and Christmas and Advent stories, but actually seeing them as part of something which is much bigger. Yeah, I wonder absolutely. would you have any comments just on the importance of of those who are studying the scriptures having a mind which is open to to a god who's at work all the way through genesis to revelation a, a god who's who's communicating and and working um in oneness in that story right um and, and that's it's helpful to know the background um both for christians qua christians but also in terms of christian jewish relations mm. Um, the canon, the, the scriptural order of what the church calls the Old Testament and what Jews call the Tanakh, the Torah, which is the Pentateuch, the Nevi'im or the prophets and the Ketuvim, the writings, it's a different scriptural order. So the Christian Old Testament ends with Malachi pointing forward to the coming of Elijah and then John the Baptist pops into the Elijah role, at least for Matthew, Mark and Luke, and then you're off. So it, it, Jesus is the middle of the story, right? It begins with Genesis, Jesus is the middle, and the book of Revelation, which never directly quotes the Old Testament, but alludes to it in pretty much every verse. Yes. It's right? saturated with it without the direct quotes. Um, that's, that's the completion. So it's a quite linear story. Um, and if you know that, um, well, the people who were Jesus' followers knew that because their Bible, the only Bible that they had, is what eventually becomes the Old Testament. 
So when they tell the story of Jesus, they're going to use the Old Testament as a guide, and the two are going to become reflexive. Through their belief in Jesus, through their understanding of the resurrection, they're going to go reread that text, and they're going to see things in it that they had not seen before. Um, and you can see that very clearly at the end of the Gospel of Luke, the story of the two on the road to Emmaus, which, and then, which is funny because Jesus is in disguise, and they're saying, you know, we thought he was going to redeem Israel. And it's like, picture Jesus with his hands behind his back going, <laughs> you know, just wait. Um, uh, he gives them this high-end Bible study. You know, did you not know that the Messiah was supposed to suffer? Well, it didn't occur to us. Well, let me tell you. So he gives them this, this big Bible study, right? Um, and they actually still don't get it until that Eucharistic scene when, when, when again, they're eating, right? Um, so you see the text differently, as Jesus tells you in this high-end Bible story. Um, the Old Testament for the church reflects Jesus on every page because you now read it through Jesus colored lenses, right? Like the two on a road to Emmaus finally figured out, right? And that's what Paul is doing in second Corinthians and so on. So you read it through Jesus colored lenses. Um, and then you see all these connections that you might not have seen before. That's great, okay? Um, so here's part of the problem and, and you're correct. We sometimes think, Christians sometimes think about, you know, um, the, we start with Christmas and we forget all that other stuff. You don't, because if you start with Christmas, you missed all that stuff that came before and that's mm -hmm. kind of silly, right? right. Um, it's also a problem in Jewish Christian relations. So when my friends tell me, you know, the world was in darkness and suddenly light came, did you miss the Old Testament? <laughs> did you miss the Psalms? <laughs> did you miss the story of David? Did you miss Esther, which is a great book? You know, what about Ruth? You know, there's all that really good stuff back there. So if you miss that stuff, you also miss the links between Christianity and Judaism. Judaism is not the Old Testament. It's the commentary on the Old Testament in the same way that the New Testament is a commentary on the Old Testament. Um, but if we dismiss all that stuff, you also wind up doing damage to Jewish Christian relations and you do damage to the word of God because the God to whom Jesus prayed when he said, Father, let this cup pass from me and the God to whom his followers prayed when he taught them to pray our father is the God who created heaven and earth. And what do they know about him? Well, what they know about him is in part what they know from the Old Testament. You Thank can't you one sure. without the other. That, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, it's so much more interesting. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. And, and the thanks. more we understand Judaism, the better it forms our understanding of Christianity. That's right. It, it also takes us out of being the center of the universe because <laughs> we're not, and we never have been. <laughs> and I would also add, like, it just begs a wee bit of work with the scripture as well. Um, how often do we lift that proof text out and we, you know, we apply it to our individual lives and we never think about it again, but, but finding these links, sitting with a teacher who can, who can show you the stories and the links and remembering that, that all of the books of the Old Testament are included in, in the scriptures for a reason. Um, and yeah. it begs a wee bit of work on our part to pull all of this together. And the same with the revelation as well at the end of the text. It begs the work to not get caught up in conspiracy theories in Revelation, but to actually find John's references um, into, into the stories of the Old Testament, because it's loaded with them. Right. So you don't have to say like the price product code is, is the mark of the beast or you know, whatever yeah. else. Yeah. <laughs> Go back. I like the idea of doing the work, um, but it should be work that's enjoyable. Yeah. So think about relationship with the text like a relationship with a person you love, right? Um, in order for that relationship to endure and grow, it requires a little bit of work on the part of, on, you know, because mm -hmm. if you just stay with, you know, um, I, I, here's what I know about you from the first date. There's a little bit more work. Go, go meet the, in, the potential in-laws and find out what the favorite foods are and find out what the, the, the little annoying things are and whether you can deal with them or not. Um, and always be willing to be surprised because the person you've lived with for 50 years can still do something that surprises you and delights you. That requires a little bit of work, but it's, it's enjoyable work. It's, it's like people who like to garden. I can't imagine in your knees in the dust with the dirt, I break, you know, I break a nail. Um, but people like that stuff. Um, I like to knit and knitting is, just, that's a lot of work, but it's so productive and so, yeah. so enjoyable. And it's the same thing with reading the Bible. If you do the work, boy, is it productive, boy, is it enjoyable, and you keep seeing new things. 
I can see, and AJ, I have to say this on page 125 of your book, you have this sentence that says such new insights should continue into the future as well, because even a fulfillment citation does not exhaust the meaning of the text being cited. That really spoke to me because I think the more we read scripture, the more the Holy Spirit reveals a new insight into the word that we hadn't seen there before. And I certainly know that's been true for my much more limited scholarly endeavors in, into the Bible. But I found that statement so resoundingly hopeful to, uh, to encourage others who read the Bible and who are completely mystified by it to say, keep digging, keep rereading, because yeah. you will see something new and fresh. Right. I mean, I know that to be true for a variety of reasons. Um, if you read a text when you're six and you read the same text when you're 60 and you get the same message, something has gone dreadfully wrong and it hasn't gone wrong with the text. Hallelujah. Um, <laughs> it, yeah. And so here's part of the problem. The Christian tradition, as it developed, tended to foreclose multiple interpretations. Like it meant one thing. Why? Because people who gathered together initially as followers of Jesus, and then as Paul began and fellow apostles began to spread the message out to the broader Gentile world, the one thing that was holding them together was belief, because they weren't held together by ethnicity, as Jews would be as a people. Uh, they weren't held together by geography. So it was belief that held them together. Now, if you're held together by belief, you don't want to argue too much. Because if you argue too much, then you're going to believe yourself out of the system. So in the same way the church invented a faith community, we would call that a religion, the church also invented heresy. Right? So they didn't want to have multiple interpretations because that's going to put you into another system. Jews, on the other hand, you're born Jewish. I mean, you can convert if you want, but most Jews, are, they're born into the system. Like you're born a, a Peruvian or a Kenyan or French or whatever from Scotland, hmm? Just taking a wee guess. Um, Close. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so so um, you're already in the system and if you have an idea they can't throw you out because it's part of you so the Jewish tradition just glories in multiple interpretations and the reason I know that works is not only because of what I hear in the synagogue but every time I teach a text even if I'm teaching a graduate level seminar on a gospel my students come up with questions I had not asked and answers I had not considered and it happens every year Mm. So it's it's well, it's it, it's replete. It's a repository of huge amounts of stuff, some of which we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. And we've been landing in that again and again through these um, these four weeks, AJ. Um, just uh, you know, the ability to look at a text, to um, to read between the lines, to ask the question about what's going on behind the scenes, to let your imagination get to work with a text, and to to invite God to to be at work. Uh, in us and through us and through our conversation as as we open up to to what else is going on and um, answering the questions about the things that the text doesn't tell us it's been it's been very powerful for us actually and i'm from northern ireland by the way not scott uh, <laughs> like really close i'm sorry i i have a question if nobody else does drew you look like you're right I, yeah i'm i'm really fascinated your comment about sort of the Christ, the early church being held together by belief rather than um sort of and that sort of that drive or that leading us to that sort of literalism is just really fast. It's, it's a fascinating thing as we're sort of in our denominational challenges about belief and how do you reconcile different beliefs of scripture within the same faith community. And I mean, certainly Judaism has had differences in belief in the sort of like stark differences, but held together through that. And I'm just wondering sort of how that how can we as a church reclaim that sense of togetherness and discussion over scripture, which yeah. retains that richness with still that diversity? Yeah. I'm not sure if you can answer, but. Sure. I mean, and, and I don't know, because my students worry about this as well. And I worry about it because I worry about denominations splitting over you know, a variety of things um, or people saying, I can't be a member of this church anymore because the pastor said X and I don't believe X, right? So leave. Um, so Judaism, Jews are not held together by belief per se. You can be a Jew and be an atheist. So belief, belief is not a sine qua non, right? If your mother's Jewish, you're Jewish. Um, but how can the church do it? Um, because the, the church has something called baptism. 
And baptism is technically indelible. I mean, you can't see it. It's not like, say, circumcision, where half the population can see it. Um, but it is indelible. Uh, and I think if the church took its baptism, more, people in the church took baptism more seriously, they would be able to have within that system, as long as they're, uh, they're invested in the system, they should be able to debate better. Wow. Right. Hey, and Harry, then, you're going to preach you baptism are, Sunday? Yeah. You got done, right? <laughs> I'm, you. I'm taking notes. <laughs> okay, so, so how do you have a conversation where there's a debate? I mean, there are some debates in, in the Bible. We might want to pay attention to those. Um, Apostolic Council in chapter 15 of Acts. I mean, that's actually technically a debate. I mean, the fix is in, you know who's going to win. Um, when Jesus has arguments with fellow Jews, that's debate. And the fix is in again, because it's his story. Um, but when he debates with people about, um, you know, what, what's appropriate to do on the Sabbath or not, I mean, th those are good questions. And there were rules for debating. Like, how do you, Jesus cites context, right? Um, or he cites um, uh, from an argument from the greater to the lesser. If you pull a sheep out of a pit on the Sabbath, you're going to heal a person on the Sabbath. That's a typically Jewish way of arguing. So you argue by the rules. I think it's good. Um, I have a question, something that is always, and then there's a question in the chat, but I'm going to ask mine first. Um, the one of the things that you talked about in the book was this concept that if we say when you're talking about um, death and God was I, I can't remember where the quote is, but you talk about how um, if we say, oh, God took an angel to heaven, then he's leaving everybody else behind and vice versa. You know what I'm you know what I'm referencing? Yeah, absolutely. You know, God, God chooses those he loves. And I'm thinking, what am I chop liver? I mean, right. you know, so, so it's not, it's not a the Christians have trouble with this because they want it to be I, God's laid out a plan and God takes what God wants. And I've always pushed back against that because of exactly what you said in the book. I'd love to hear you talk about it from a, like from your perspective and from your understanding of why this is not actually how God works in the world. Um, and so in my, in your perspective, and I would be interested in hearing that. Well, talking about how God works in the world is above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> I can, but I, what I can do is say, um, if I want to understand my particular circumstance as a human being, um, then sometimes stuff is just left out to be mysterious. I mean, my father died when I was 13. I don't know why. Just, 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 I mean, he had a heart attack. He died. There's no logic to that. Um, the last book I wrote for Abingdon was on the Sermon on the Mount, um, which and, and this came out in August. And I spent a lot of time um, in March and April as we're, we're going to the final version of this, revising the part about blessed to those who mourn and really developed it um, because we were lo losing people to COVID including some people I knew who, who got it very, very early on in New York. Um, I, why people die is a mystery. How people deal with it, that you can address and recognizing that different people will need different things at different times. And sometimes, and this would be the case with the book of Job, sometimes the best thing is to do what Job's friend, friends did right at the beginning after Job had lost his wife and all of his kids and his physical health and his property. And he's sitting on a, you know, a, a dung heap scratching his sores. And they sit there for seven days and they don't say anything. It's only when they open their mouth that they get into trouble. Exactly. <laughs> So sometimes it's just a matter of being present. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a matter of sharing a memory that might provide some comfort. And you can see that um, even in the Gospel of John, this is weird, um, where John has all these, these negative comments about the Jews, the Jews, and for the most part, it's not really good. Uh, but in John 11, which is the Lazarus scene, it says the Jews came to comfort Mary and Martha. Mm -hmm. You know, it was one of my friends said they probably bought a ham, and I said, no, I don't think so. Um, but it, the sense of, you know, just kind of being present um, and sharing some food to make sure that the people in mourning are still eating yep. and still dealing and then, and then working with it carefully. But don't justify it because there's no justification. And people who are in mourning generally know that there's no justification. Yep. And for those people who can believe, um, to say the God whom you proclaim in the church, the God whom you proclaim in the synagogue is a God of mercy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And sometimes you just have to say, I can't do anything more now. Yep. This is now God's job. It's like you said at the beginning, it's above our pay grade. Why are we trying to decide mm-hmm. why people died or didn't die? So I appreciate that. Thank you. The yeah. question in the comments real fast. Um, one of our friends, Sherry says, why is the CEB truer to the Greek translation? So I think she's asking about the, trans- obviously the CEB translation. Yeah, well, I don't think it is. Um, but the CEB Abingdon has the copyright and this is an Abingdon publication. Um, so what I would have wanted, and this is what I do in the non-adult, like the big books. So the parables book, for example, the, the, the new book I, I did with Mark Brettler on the Bible with and without Jesus, which is part of that. If it's fulfilled, in G, the New Testament says, and this goes back to the other AJ's comment. Um, it, it, the Bible says, and this, this was done to fulfill what was said by the prophet. So what we did is we looked at all those texts and said, well, what does the Jewish tradition say about those? There's like multiple readings. Um, I would do my own translation. And sometimes in the, in the Advent book, I give you, you know, like, this Greek really means that. So it's, it's the matter of the preferred translation of the press. Mm. Right. Is it closer to the Greek? Sometimes closer than the NRSV or the NIV? Sometimes not. Do you it's, have a favorite it, translation other than your own? No. Because <laughs> um, because individual Bible books are done by individuals and then they go to a committee. So there's a new NRSV, a new New Revised Standard Version that's about to come out. They asked me if I would do the Matthew translation and I went no because I was too busy. Uh, but I said, if you want me to read the whole thing when you're done to check for particularly depictions of women and depictions of Jews, I'd be happy to do that. They, they haven't come back to me, just, which may be just as well. Um, all transla- translations are traitors. Any translation is traitorous because all words have certain nuances in one language that they lose in another language. Um, so, and even when you go to the Greek, I mean, and Hebrew even more so because Hebrew is a more compact language. Um, words, there's a lot of puns that we're gonna miss Right. So I, in the classroom, I usually use the NRSV. Why? Um, if I'm doing the New Testament, because the book that I assign to my students is the Jewish annotated New Testament, because I want them to see the footnotes and I want them to have the back essays. And Oxford was able to get the NRSV mm-hmm. through National Council of Churches from copyright. I, but if my students can't read Greek or Hebrew, I tell them to get a couple of different Bibles and look at all of them. Um, AJ, this is awesome. I, I would like to um, to just sort of uh, alight on on one of the um, sentences that you write. It's, it's page 116 of your text, and, and it was just a sentence that stood out to me at the end of a section. You said, we know from David's story and from Jesus's that the lament is answered and that God keeps God's promises. And I was just really struck by two things. I did my doctoral work on this, this topic of lament, and so that's why I caught my attention, but also just this idea of God keeping keeping God's promises. Um, and, and I think that, that, you know, the more I study scripture, the more I teach it in groups, um, the more I preach it Sunday by Sunday, the more I, I understand that we're dealing and worshiping and serving a God who keeps God's promises over, over the span of eternity. Um, I, I don't know if just um, that's what has attracted me to the work that you're doing and sort of keeping gospel texts in touch with, with, uh, with um, more uh, Old Testament texts. Um, but this idea of a faithful God um, all the way through is just what has struck me. And I wonder how that informs um, your own work, your own belief, your own um, relationship between your, sort of, your, your own Jewish belief and, and your work with Christians. Um, how does this this faithful God uh, inform and and um, energize your your work um, of study and of of teaching? Uh, for me, it's primarily the message of the Bible, both testaments. Um, so that if you look at, for example, I have to go out of the Christmas story to do this briefly. Um, if you look at Jesus' comment to the Sadducees who don't believe in resurrection. Right. So they ask him about this woman who's been married to seven brothers. Whose wife is she in the resurrection? Well, since they don't believe in the resurrection, they don't care what the answer is. They just want to point out that this, is, this, is, this would be an odd or somewhat awkward situation. Um, and Jesus, as, as is his want when he's put on, he's given one of these difficult to answer questions. He says, you've asked the wrong question, right? Because God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. 
question. Um, well, one way you know that is because um, you have all these promises that were made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, that they would have children as numerous as the stars of the heaven and, and the sands of the seashore. And then you look at the Jewish, tr Christian, and indeed Muslim tradition, because they're going to backtrack to them as well, to some extent. Um, so look, that came true, right? Which means somehow Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still have to be alive because of promise made, you know, if, if, if it if it continues, but you're not there to witness it, it doesn't count, right? It's there. So it's, there's a sense of fidelity over time. Yeah. Um, the covenantal relationship that God has with the Jewish people, which is never abrogated, and the new covenant, which Jesus establishes with his particular followers, and, and then primarily the Gentile church, mm -hmm. that's not abrogated either. Um, and you can get back to backdoor this into the Christmas story by looking at the fidelity of the tradition. Um, one of the parts I really, really like about the Gospel of Matthew um, is that citation of Rachel weeping for her children, which is Jeremiah 31, which is the new covenant passage, right? Um, so uh, you have the slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem, and then you have Rachel weeping. For, this was done to fulfill what was said by the prophet, Ra Rachel weeping for her children because they are no more. The next verse is stop your weeping because your children will come home which for Jeremiah is a comment to the people of Israel, the people of Judah being taken into Babylonian exile, you will be repatriated, you will go back to, to the homeland. Uh, and for Matthew's readers and for, for Jewish readers of the first century and for traditional Jews to this day, that's a promise of resurrection. So do I believe in, not in a creedal sense, I'm not a creedal sort of person, most Jews aren't. Um, I think it's a really good idea. Um, just th that sense of at some point, there's there's a reuniting somehow. And if it doesn't happen, you can still live into it. Right. Wow. Um, listen, we've got like three more minutes. Uh, does anybody have a, have a final question or comment that they would like to move on quickly? Go ahead, Drew. I'm just wondering, like, what are you working on now? What's the question that is sort of interesting that you're exploring in this season? Um, well, the, the book, The Bible With and Without Jesus, that I did with Mark Brettler, which came out in October, uh, Mark and I are now working on an article that we couldn't get into the book because we already had something like 600 pages of manuscript. Um, so we're looking at Psalm 2, which is this you are my son's sonship language to see how it's used in the new testament because it's specifically quoted in acts um, and then to see how it's used in other forms of judaism so that's a quick article that i need to get done um, i'm working on a project with abingdon on the difficult sayings of jesus of which there are many mm -hmm. um, so how to address uh stuff that that trips up my students uh, that that people in congregations worry about um, and I'm trying to finish up a big Jesus book. Um, it's not what would Jesus do? Because I think that's not a wise question. Jesus doesn't live in a participatory democracy. So and he, and Jesus didn't have internet. Um, but rather, how do the stories of Jesus help us think through contemporary concerns about economics or family values, politics, um, immigration, slavery? And really take some of those statements um, in a, what did they mean then? What have they meant through time? And then what do we do with it? So when Jesus talks about uh, being a slave um, or parable say, you should, you should be like a slave who does it because this is your duty. Knowing what we know today about slavery, is that language even usable? So how do we talk about that? Um, how do we talk about Jesus vis-a-vis -vis the political system or vis-a-vis -vis the, the local religious systems? Jesus vis-a-vis -vis the law. Yeah. Um, wow. and I had it done and then COVID hit and then I started rethinking, which is typically what happens. Yeah. This, right. comes out, this comes later. Um, AJ, thank you so, so much for joining us today um, for just like putting up with our questions and answering them so graciously. Oh, uh, this has been an awful lot of fun for us. Um, uh, first off, working through the book and just thinking through your thoughts on the Advent stories as we preach them, teach them, um, do our best to live into this, this calling day in, day out. So thank you 
um, for that. And then thank you for your time today. Um, and I know our congregation have appreciated it, just watching some of the comments coming through on social media there. Um, and, uh, and we really just want to wish you um, all the very best for those projects that you've got coming up um, and, uh, and as you continue um, your own work of, of teaching and engaging students um, in the Bible. Thank you for your kind words. So two comments before we go. Uh -huh. um, one, if any of your viewers have additional questions for me, they are welcome to email me. You can find me at Vanderbilt University, so I'm very easy to track down. Um, and second, I just wanted to wish you all very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and all good things for the future. What a pleasure it's been to talk with you. You've made my day. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for so much, AJ. That your graciousness is awesome. Thank you. You guys are great. Bye-bye. Take care. Okay. Uh, well, that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> there are still some really good comments coming through on our Facebook page. Um, but I think this has been a really great class, Pastor Charlie, and so I'm thankful we did this. Yeah. I'm very thankful we did it. It's, yeah. it's um, you know, over the years, you, you do so many Advent studies, and, you know, and some, there, I will admit, sometimes I'm feeling like, oh, this is getting a little stale. Um, this really uh, just informed me and taught me and uh, I'm really grateful for it. And I've so appreciated the interaction between us at the same time. It's been awesome. I really just like her authenticity within the way she feels her call in life is not only to be a faithful Jew, but also to help others do the work that they're called to. She's not intimidated by the differences in our beliefs. And I just think it's amazing. Um, yeah. And so I just really appreciate it. I do have to say, while we're still live, I have a plug. If you're still watching and you enjoy this format, um, or if you have other ideas for classes you want, um, we, I'm always, just send me an email, send me a text, comment on the live feed. Um, we're always looking for ways to teach and to edify and to educate you all and ourselves. So I couldn't stop the feed without ask, saying that. Yeah, uh, this has been a great format, guys. Just as I said to AJ in our conversation, the opportunity just to sort of teach together and uh, we don't get that very often and so this has actually been really rich in terms of of having that opportunity so and um, so thank you for your time every week as well and pastor drew thank you for connecting with amy jill levine and setting this up today and doing that work he's been like a giddy child for 60 minutes then drinking it in so. i kept it in <laughs> you played it cool you played it cool and so. carrie thank you for choosing this book yeah. That was great. It is so good. I'm I'm not might have to leave and buy all of her other books. So yeah, maybe not all of them, but hey, um, it only remains for me to say to everybody that's still hanging on there, um, the we want you to have a very merry merry Christmas. We hope that uh, we get to see you at some point next uh, tomorrow on Christmas Eve, or that you get to see us on screen if you're joining us online. And we have a bunch of services. You can find those mumconline.com forward slash Christmas um, to find out all of those details or check out the Facebook page that you watch this broadcast on. It's all on there. And um, this has been a great study and we hope to join you all again in something similar at some stage in the future. God bless you and take care. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs>